one of the benefits I think of, of a platform like this is that if you are busy clinically or if you can't watch or listen or engage um, real time, you can do this at other times. So that is fabulous for such a time as this. So delighted to be with you all, albeit virtually um, on the screen. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Dunkley Bent. I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. And good morning to everyone. Welcome indeed to this Scottish Midwifery Online Festival. And good morning and welcome to the Maternity and Midwifery London online festival. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Maternity and Midwifery Festival. What 2020 has shown us is that there's a real need for vigilance, that women's rights are not yet really embedded um, in our maternity system and that they can be easily eroded. My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored. The hard truth is there is a lot of racism there. It's not enough to be non-racist swimming in a pool of racism. You have to be anti-racist, actively working against racism. And I say that because when we treat the least, well, everybody benefits. And if I had a take home message, looking at my career and where I've been in my career, my take home message would be grab it every opportunity you can. It's not a rehearsal. Know your limitations because jam too thinly spread is tasteless. Enjoy all and let nobody, nobody steal your sparkle. And I hope that you can take valuable insights from today. And if you're listening tonight or if you're listening next week or next month, take valuable insights from the speakers from today and share the word, share the positive messages with your colleagues. Because in these dark times, in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. Thank you very much. And um, we are in this together. We stand united together. And good evening to everybody. Welcome to this fifth episode of the fourth series of Maternity and Midwifery Hour. Um, my name's Sue MacDonald. It's my honour to be the curator of the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and this hour. Um, and we're joined this evening by Saoirse McGee, who's a specialist fetal wellbeing midwife at Croydon, and Dr Mary Sheridan, who is newborn and infant physical examination night lead at... Um, King's College. So welcome to both of you. And we always start this and we put our speakers on the spot for a little moment of the week. So could we put you on the spot and Saoirse, could you share with us your moment of the week? Hi. Um, yeah, so my moment of the week is um, I've just noticed in my garden, my flowers are starting to bloom. Um, so it's a fantastic um, to see and know that spring's finally here um, and it's really made my week just to go out into the garden really observe and to see them lovely spring is here the winter's over it's fantastic thank you thank you for that Saoirse how about Mary 
Uh, yeah, mine's similar. I went on Sunday to um, do some shopping um, and I, you know, I thought that was going to be the highlight of my week <laughs> to get out to the shops. But actually, as I was driving through some country areas, I saw all the bluebells were out, you know, because it, it was just, uh, you know, amazing to see that all that colour and the, and the greenery and the, the trees in blossom. So um, after we've all been locked in, um, it was great to get out and, you know, also see the spring out there. Amazing. It's wonderful. How nature knows what to do without us. Fantastic. Thank you for those moments. We've got a great place to start. Now, I'm just reminding people that these hours were developed, developed in response to the COVID pandemic. And it, the idea behind this was to provide a continuing professional development opportunity and also to get information out there in a timely way to people who are very busy and very stressed and maybe only had a very short time to sort of catch up with CPD. Perfect this is also if you're thinking about your revalidation or if you've got a project to do or if you're learning about the particular topic and I think there'll be some people with us this evening who've got who for that is true um, and these are all accessible alongside all the maternity and midwifery festival um, resources through Matflix. So anybody who wants to catch up, replay, or just look at the, the back catalogue, loads of information, loads of uh, wonderful resources for you. You're very welcome to go and dig through them. Um, and probably you better have a big cup of coffee with you and a few biscuits, because you'll get just addicted to it, I can promise you. Okay, we're moving along the road map. And now along, I think there are lots of things opening next week. Um, which is good news and it's very positive and now the the sort of statistics are looking a lot better especially in the vaccination area and that's fantastic but of course there still are people who are poorly and in hospital and being cared for so we send a big thank you to people who are caring for them the nurses and, mid and midwives doctors all healthcare workers looking after people in the accident emergency and high dependency and intensive care um, and also we we have to say a big thank you to all our maternity staff who've carried on because you have to because mothers and babies still need care so thank you to those people and a thank you to people in the vaccination centres because I know there's quite a lot of our midwife colleagues who are also doubling up doing vaccination work so well done on you too and of course the key workers that keep everything going thank you to you so that's that's a big thank you all the way around i think that probably takes care of just about everyone in the uk anyway so thank you now tonight is the end of ramadan so i want to wish all of our muslim friends and our colleagues eid mubarak and i hope i've said that in a correct way and i hope that the year ahead is peaceful and filled with joy and health and all the things that you would wish at the end of Ramadan. It's also today the International Day of the Nurse. So big greetings to our nurse colleagues and friends all over the world. And I had my moment of the week was sending out a, a sort of tweet uh, with uh, I look for an image of nursing and my nursing background and found an old image of me with a hat and a bow under my chin in the days when that that's what we did. And so I had a little sort of reminisce, which was lovely. And I, having feedback from friends all over was also really lovely too. Okay, also the Brits were last night. I like to have plenty of good news in here. Um, and it was lovely to see Dame Elizabeth Anyonwu, Anyon I'd just say Dame Elizabeth actually, honoured last week also at the Brits. She's done so much for sickle cell and has, is an inspiration to us all. Fantastic. So well done, Dame Elizabeth, to you. It's also Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week. So look out for any events or resources. I know that Mummy Star, the charity, and also the Practicing Midwife are doing a lot of activities in that area. So do have a look, see what's available to just raise the awareness. Um, another um, report that you might find useful is the Association of South, South Asian Midwives and Society of African Caribbean Midwives uh, have released a report this week from work with black and brown midwives and it's called What We Need to Thrive, Experiences of Ethnically Marginalised Midwifery Professionals in the Workplace. 
I put this on the resources page and it's really worth reading and it's quite uncomfortable reading actually because the midwives and nurses who were um, interviewed were giving some quite um, shocking comments on things that were said to them, ways they were treated and I think we need to take that on board. This is an ongoing pathway we're on um, but it's worth reading so have a look. There's also on a slight change of scene, the still the NHS supply chain uniform survey, which you may wish to participate in. Quite simple to put your views forward. And I know some midwives feel very strongly about uniform. So do put, put your 10 penworth in. So check out the resources page for that. So I've jumped through all that news and I'll say Eid Mubarak again, just to complete the sense of the circle and I'll move to the main meat of the evening which I think is really important we're looking very much at the baby this evening we're looking at fetal physiology and monitoring and we're looking at the examination of the newborn and I think this is especially important at the moment because we're aware of the standards of proficiency from the NMC which are uh, creating quite a bit of work for teaching midwives and for midwives and for lecturers as they look at the curriculum, because there are certain aspects of the curriculum that are being enhanced, I would say. And one of them is around examination newborn, which is becoming much more part of that curriculum with the, the proficiencies. So we need we need to look at that for midwives who are existing in practice, who many of whom will have completed the examination newborn programme or night programmes, um, but some of whom ha haven't and might need to update themselves, but also for the students going through the programmes who will, this will form part of their programme. So we're going to start first of all um, with Saoirse. I'm delighted to welcome Saoirse McGee, who's a specialist of fetal wellbeing midwife at Croydon Health Services, NHS Trust. She trained at St George's and she's worked in all areas of midwifery, but she settled into uh, fetal wellbeing as her passion. And she's currently undertaking a master's in patient safety and clinical human factors at Edinburgh University, which I would say is really informing the work she's doing at the moment. She's implemented a thorough CTG training with human factors for the doctors and midwives at Croydon, which is, has a 95 compliance, 95 percent, sorry, compliance rate with training and the lowest HIE rates in Southwest London at present. And I'm sure Saoirse is going to share the, this with you. So I'm really so delighted she's with us. So welcome, Saoirse. The screen is now yours. Thank you, Sue. I'm just going to share my screen. Bear with me. everyone see that. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. Um, hope you're all well. I'm going to be looking at um, the midwife's role in fetal monitoring this evening and ensuring that we understand the whole clinical picture as well um, in regards to fetal physiology. Um, so the few things that we're going to discuss this evening is looking at the current research, guidance and evidence based practice, um, importance of the whole clinical practice, uh, whole clinical picture when interpreting CCG traces, um, advocating for women during labour with fetal monitoring and the transition from the fetus to newborn, very brief at the, towards the end. So as part of our as part of our role as a midwife, the NMC competency demonstrates that we must look at women holistically through pregnancy. This includes the assessment during labour as well as looking at the whole clinical picture. Recent research and reports have demonstrated the importance of not just listening effectively to the fetal heart rate, but looking at the whole clinical picture. If we look at the Each Baby Counts reports over the years, um, this has found the importance of listening effectively, escalating an appropriate time frame, understanding the human factors within the maternity unit. However, Sadly, the statistics are showing the amount of babies that are severely brain injured, neonatal deaths or stillbirths has not changed much since 2015. The findings have shown that actually over 70% would have had a different outcome if different care was delivered. Um, and multitude of factors have impacted this. Ineffective CTG monitoring is a part of this and it's scary to understand that failure to act upon 
abnormal CCG is one of the highest causes. That's something that I'm going to later discuss. Mm. Um, we've all heard of Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle version 2. And this is something that's in, had a huge impact within our maternity units within the UK and has had the massive support from NHS resolutions with CNST, which we're all striving to be a part of. Um, effective fetal monitoring element four is what we are focusing on to currently um, ensure that all staff have current training that's up to date and implement an effective risk assessment and hourly fresh eyes. Um, again, we have the Ocogen report, which is shown a massive light on what can happen when effective uh, risk assessment is not followed. Um, this is something that we're key when focusing on interpreting CCG traces, that we have adequate timeframes. Um, HSHIP has also been a massive influential in the way we report writing within our risk in maternity, but also discussion with families, especially when something goes wrong or a bad outcome. Um, it also looks at the systematic approaches and systematic failures rather than a blame culture, which is something that's really, really had a massive impact, especially when interpreting CTGs. It's not someone's fault, but actually we're looking at what could we actually impact on our system. Now, all of these reports are fundamental and it's um, not only going to affect us as a midwife, but we want to provide the best care for our women. Now, we need to do this by ensuring that we're up to date with our knowledge and up to date with our training with our obstetricians and our midwives. Um, Saving Babies Lives has obviously now um, focused on having a lead for this and obviously I'm one of these, a lead for fetal monitoring or lead for fetal wellbeing. Um, and this has helped to demonstrate that actually the obstetricians and the midwives both have support for our midwives who are interpreting CCGs, the doctors interpreting CCGs, if they're good outcomes, bad outcomes, it's good to have these discussions and make it a regular part of our day. Now, moving on to the main topic of this discussion um, is to look at the whole clinical picture. Over the years, there's been a massive system change in regards to fetal monitoring. We used to have, and there used to be a multitude of different guidelines, different words, different phrases, how we can interpret them. But it's really important actually that the focus is now going back onto the fetus and the mum. We're not just looking at a guideline at three o'clock in the morning and thinking, right, which box does this baby fit in? We're taking a step back and we're looking at mum and we're looking at baby and we're saying, okay, what's going on? What can we do? How can we actually, what is this fetus telling us in labour? And by just looking at a CCG trace, it can tell us a whole world of things, not just this is a fetal heart rate of 120 beats per minute. Now, the NHS loves an acronym, and especially in maternity, I know we do as well. So I've, I've broken this down into two, as you can see on either side of the screen, to mothers and the six Ps. Um, now, the six Ps is what I'm going to focus on just a little bit, because actually, when we're in caring, when we're in labour, <laughs> when we're caring for women in labour, especially, um, we do this subconsciously, but having it instilled in our practice and prompting us is something that we can look at when risk, assess risk assessing appropriately. Now we'll start with problems. Now this mainly focus on the mothers that we're looking after. And this goes to the second acronym that we can see on the left-hand side. Mothers can be broken down into meconium, oxytocin, temperature, hemorrhage, hyperstimulation, epidural environment, the rate of progress of labor, scar, sepsis, and size. size. Now these are all factors that we may or may not see in the woman that we're caring for, but these will all impact on our fetus and how the fetus is going to cope with the current stresses in labour. Moving on, we then have parity. We are evident and we know that actually the more babies you have, it can sometimes be quicker, but actually if that fetus is not necessarily coping, it doesn't matter if you're a para four or a para naught, actually the fetus is telling us a story and telling us that we're not coping. So it's really important to not Take into, take into consideration that we've got a primip or a multip, but actually how that was going to impact on this fetus. The next is power. Now we know contractions are paramount for labour. It's how we have a baby. So, but ensuring that we're reviewing these appropriately and that we're looking at the contractions. Are we having good resting tone? That resting tone allows our fetus to become reoxygenated. And if we are having adequate resting tone, in between these, are these contractions, are they strong? Are we palpating? Are we feeling that these are coordinate? The next is the passenger, which is the most important part. The passenger is going to tell us if we're appropriate size when we're palpating with our fundal height measurements, but also when we're doing an appropriate VE. Through this VE, 
we're not just basing on she's five centimeters or 10 centimeters. We're looking at actually what's the position? Is there kappa? Is there molding? What position is baby in? Are we thinking that she's going to take another seven hours, 12 hours, or actually is delivery imminent? Because this will all impact on what we're decision making for our CTG trace. Now, sorry. <laughs> Now, all of this will equal to the predicted time of delivery. And it's really important that knowing and understanding all of these risks are actually going to help us to focus on what our plan of action will be. The next slide is a lovely colourful slide, which I think is really helpful. And it's a good tool to use when we're looking at risk assessment and CCG interpretation. Now, I use this because it helps us to prompt no matter where you are in labor to think actually, okay, I've now taken a hand over from a lady who's six centimeters who's come to the birth center. Okay, or six centimeters come to label, she's got meconium on board. I need to ask myself, right, have I reviewed fresh eyes? Have I done the six Ps? Is my baseline changed from antenatal? It gives you prompts, especially in the second stage as well. When we think about the importance of where the fetal heart is in relation to maternal heart rate as well it's very easy to pick up maternal heart rate in the second stage so it's that prompt okay do we need a fetal scalp electrode here are we thinking about where my fetus is in relation are we pushing for an hour and we're still not getting much descent what is happening the whole clinical picture <clears throat> just to here sorry advocating for women um so it's really really important that actually we are advocating for women regularly. We do it all the way through the pregnancy, antenatally, intrapartum and postnatally. And this is part of our code. This is part of, it's renowned through us. But it's important that actually when we're caring for women in labour, that we're thinking about what is happening. So we ask, how is mum? How is baby? How is baby's movements? But if we feel that things are deteriorating or we feel like the trace is becoming abnormal, then we think to ourselves, how are we going to escalate this appropriately? We think about what team we're working alongside and that appropriate SBAR handover that we're having. Now, the SBAR handover that we're having with the doctors during ward round is fundamental to understand that we're using the correct terminology when escalating. Um, there's a really fantastic tool um, and video that I've seen um, called The Voice Inside. It's available. You can Google it from the University of Leicester Hospital. And it's a fantastic resource, actually, to demonstrate effective communication and um, it uses the scenario where a midwife holds up a CTG to her colleague and says this CTG is okay isn't it and her colleague goes yeah it's okay and you can see how actually the correct terminology wasn't used and actually we can bias unconsciously bias control each other and we think well this is okay well yeah it's okay when we think to ourselves actually, if we had looked into this, this is an abnormal CCG trace, or this is actually, I'm worried about this CCG trace because of X, Y, and Z. You've clearly demonstrated this. And having that care plan discussion with the woman as well, her plan and her care plan can change throughout labor. It can be on an hourly basis. And it's really important, actually, we're having that discussion with the woman. She could come into birth center and want a lovely birth center um, water birth, Actually, once you've risk assessed her and you think, actually, you're a meconium stain local now, I'm worried about the fetus, you will have continuous monitoring. Understanding and having that discussion with her about the importance of fetal monitoring and why we're worried or why we're making this care plan. She might have thought for the last nine months, this is her plan, this is what she wants to do. And how can we actually change and adapt that for her? And how can we support her in that? psychological safety I've put in this which is starting to become quite a big um, thing in reports at the moment and it's really important to actually um, start to understand especially working within a hospital unit and maternity unit it's a fantastic book I'm reading at the moment Amy Edmondson the fearless organization um, and it's, it's a fantastic book because I'm not quite finished yet so I don't know the ending but it's it's fantastic to look at what's happening in our workplace and understanding actually we're not going to work with the same team members every single day we're not going into it 
no one's going to an office at the moment, but we're not going to an office seeing the same people day in, day out. And we know, oh, I know what she does. I know what she does. Actually, we're going into a workplace where you'll see different midwives. You may see them once every couple of months, different doctors every couple of weeks. And who you might feel comfortable to escalate to is different to who you might feel that you're friends with or feel like you can escalate to them because they listen to you. Now, it's really important, actually, when we understand psychological safety this would impact on the care that we give our women so understand actually taking that step back and implementing this into training and thinking actually how can we break this down a bit further so our midwives feel comfortable escalating the doctors feel comfortable challenging the consultants or their colleagues it's really important next slide now this is just a very very quick because I don't want to go on too much about the neonate but it leads you on to the next um, speaker actually um, and understanding that the fetus will turn into a neonate. And it sounds very simple, but actually understanding that throughout the labour and what we're worried about, we're worried about this woman's preeclamptic and we're worried about, oh, her blood pressure or baby's got meconium or gestational diabetes. This will in turn and may affect the, fe the neonate once born, knowing that actually those concerns and worries that you had in labour don't necessarily disappear. And I think it's really, really fundamental to know when you understand the basic fetal physiology and the central nervous system, we understand that this fetus, this fetus may be redistributing and conserving its energy. It might have, you might be rushing for a category one emergency C-section and the baby is showing signs of metabolic acidosis on the core gases. But however, baby's had that first cry, everything's fine. Well, actually, it's just taking that review back and thinking, has this baby had any compromise that I might be worried about in the next couple of hours? Will this impact on my feeding? If I did a blood glucose now, will that be impacted? Because actually I've turned from an anaerobic to aerobic metabolism, etc. And it's just the importance to understand when we're worried about this fetus and when we're making plans for our hourly risk assessment, understanding that when this baby is born, do we want to make sure that this baby stays with mum? And that's the whole avoiding term admissions into neonatal unit and focusing on that baby. And that sums up my um, proud point. Thank you very much for listening. I think we have questions at the end, um, but that's it. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Sorsha. And, and that's thank you for reminding me to write, remind the audience to get some questions in because we do have 15 minutes at the end for any questions to come in. Um, and you'll notice that sometimes I look away and it's because I've got another screen where the questions are coming in. So it's not I'm distracted or anything. And it was lovely actually, so I should see you mentioning Attain, which was the project to reduce um, mother and baby separation. And that's got a whole lot of um, e-learning resources for people so we'll maybe talk about that a little bit later fantastic we haven't got any questions through yet so you can hold yourself in reserve Sorsha <laughs> and I'll move on to Mary and so thank you again Sorsha and I'm delighted to welcome Dr Mary Mary Sheridan BME or BEM which is the correct BEM BEM got to get it correct. Mary is a midwife, midwife lecturer at King's College. She's worked at Guy's and St. Thomas's for many years. She's been the lead midwife for um, the newborn and infant physical examination night program there. Throughout her career, and many of you will know Mary for this, she's been a real innovator and has worked to bring theory and practice together. Very much, that's very much Mary, I would say. Um, and she's been awarded the Chief Midwives Gold Award in 2019. She was one of the first midwives to re receive this. And it's a real, there are not many out there, are there? So no. it's a real <laughs> accolade. And she was conferred with the British Empire Medal in January for services to midwifery also. So we're delighted to welcome you, Mary. And the screen is now yours. Thank you. my slides so thank you for um, inviting me um, it was hard to know how to um, judge this presentation so I've kind of gone for um, overview of 
all things really at the beginning. And then those of you who know me know that my particular interests are breach presentation and hip dysplasia. Um, and because um, in um, April of this year, the updated guidelines and standards for NIPE, um, the main difference was the hip screening. So I'm particularly gonna focus on that. But then at the end, um, there are a number of resources that I've put together on one slide that will be available um, for everyone. So I'm gonna go through risk factors that we need to consider before examining a baby at, just after birth. Um, any postnatal examination, um, definitely um, NIPE examinations. Um, think about the observations that we undertake on a baby and how we do that. As I've mentioned, um, I'll particularly focus on hip dysplasia in this presentation. And then there are some resources um, and references um, for everyone to have a look at. Um, so following on from the first presentation. Um, obviously, a lot um, is related to genetics and the development um, of the fetus. So if we think about the first four risk factors, um, eyes, cataracts, cardiac um, conditions, hip dysplasia, and also um, hearing, which is undertaken by the hearing screeners, um, these all have quite a strong family history. Um, and we're not sure if they all have a genetic um, significance, but you know, increasingly we are finding that. So it is, I would suggest um, that a lot of these questions should be asked antenatally, and I don't think we always do that. Um, you know, it can be quite difficult sometimes um, when we start the NIPE examination, having to start by asking a whole load of questions. Um, and the mothers might be quite tired, um, the fathers might be present and they might not actually know. Um, so a lot of this, it might be quite helpful if we could think of including these questions um, during the antenatal booking. You know, it would be very helpful for us um, to know if there is any family history of congenital cataracts. We do ask, hopefully, um, if there's any family history of cardiac conditions, um, because then the women um, should be referred for a fetal cardiac scan. Um, and also with the increasing number of diabetics during pregnancy, um, they are also referred for cardiac scans as well. Hip dysplasia, um, the main things are breach, um, as shown here um, in this um, um, sketch by um, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, very important yet again, um, when we're monitoring the pregnancy to really know if this baby has ever been breached from 36 weeks onwards, because that's very important for us um, in our referrals. Um, also knowing about any family history of um, hearing problems that can just help when it comes to the postnatal period. In, especially, you know, during COVID, increasingly women have gone home very quickly um, from maternity units for a number of reasons. Um, understandable, they wanted to get out of the hospital. Um, and a lot of these um, things have to be done um, quite early. And it can be quite difficult to get a clear response very early in the hearing. Um, and then those babies have to be followed up. But if we know where there's a family history, we can obviously prioritise those. Um, obviously, at the first examination and the NIPE and every examination, any time you see a baby, um, you know, really look at the baby. And if you've ever got any doubts, a bit like um, was, you know, stated in that first presentation, um, if, if you're not sure um, about the appearance of a baby, um, I would go on your gut instinct um, because not all um, conditions are picked up at birth. Um, or picked up at the NIPE examination. And often when I do presentations in the university for um, health visitors or um, for people who are coming into health visiting who are being in child nurses, and um, they've all got stories of um, children presenting with cardiac abnormalities um, and then um, being diagnosed as having Down syndrome. It just hasn't been picked up. Um, and also sometimes it can be not missed, but it's not as obvious sometimes um, when babies are born preterm. So these are all factors um, we should consider. Um, also, sepsis has become a big issue in healthcare, um, and when caring for babies, we should be, you know, looking out for all the red flags for sepsis. 
Um, centaur and gestation, very important. Whenever you're caring for a baby, you should know what centaur the baby is on, and you should be particularly concerned if the baby's on a very low centaur. Um, I'm, students will tell you I have a phrase, beware of the 37 weaker. Um, uh, you know, a baby that's born, you know, at 37 weeks or just over 37 weeks, um, depending on the scan, you know, where somebody put the dots on the screen, that baby could have been preterm. It could have been 36 weeks plus five instead of 37 ple weeks plus one. You really have got to be looking at the behavior of the child and you can't expect them to do um, what a 42 weeker would do. Um, their stores of brown adipose tissue may not be as good. Um, they may have problems initiating feeding and maintaining their um, body temperature. Um, and that all fits in with jaundice as well. So I think if you've got a baby that's on a low centile, most units will want those babies to remain in for about 72 hours. But also I would be cautious of in transferring home babies who are just around 37 weeks um, for very much the same reasons. You know, we want to know that they can feed well. We want to know they can maintain their body temperature. Um, and they do um, increasingly um, present with jaundice that may require treatment. Uh, when we're observing a baby, um, very important always to look at colour and tone. Um, I'm a great believer that if the mother's having skin to skin contact, um, that the baby's temperature should be taken while the baby's still with the mother, having the skin to skin, not removing the baby from the mother, um, put it into uh, maybe obviously under a heater, hopefully. Um, but we need to know the baby is OK before we examine a baby, whether it's the first examination or the NIPE examination. Um, we typically start with the cardiorespiratory system because you need to know that a baby is well before you can carry on with the remainder um, of the examination. Um, I've already mentioned morphology, um, but um, I have um, picked up several babies um, on the NIPE examination um, that have various chromosomal abnormalities. And, um, you know, that wasn't picked up um, at the first examination. So that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not blaming anyone, um, but it is difficult when the parent has been told that their baby is well, that to then have to um, say that actually we may have some concerns. Um, and, you know, it's, if the baby's got a heart murmur, something like that, it's easier than to get a second opinion about the heart murmur without alerting parents that you think there's any other issues with their baby. Um, the skeletal system does need... Um, um, particular attention. Um, if you talk to an orthopedic surgeon, they would say that we should examine the hips first and before the baby gets unsettled, uh, because that's their area of um, um, expertise and they would want that to come um, first. But I'll talk more about hip examination when I talk about um, on the next slide hip dysplasia. Um, but in my experience um, of doing examinations, um, I wouldn't underestimate how. Um, upset parents can be when their baby has something like talipes. Um, I probably have seen more children with talipes, um, true talipes, um, rather than positional talipes than hip dysplasia, but they, they do find that quite um, a difficult diagnosis. Uh, and also, you know, the treatment it is quite a lengthy treatment um, with Ponseti um, treatment. So um, I wouldn't underestimate a diagnosis of um, Talipes. And obviously, looking at all areas, the abdomen of the baby, um, I tell you lots of stories, but you know, we probably haven't got time now. Um, the spine, the reflexes, and also skin, um, noting any birthmarks, um, very important sometimes for referral, um, but also very important for safeguarding. Um, and also, when the skin changes in the first couple of days, some birthmarks may not be that clear. So, it's important on every um, interaction with a baby, um, that if you see a birthmark, that it's actually documented. Um, and if you're not sure, um, always get a second opinion. Um, so just to go on to the main part, probably, of my presentation, um, looking at hip dysplasia. So um, on the um, next slide, I'll show you the documents that were published um, in April of this year, um, that for people who work in England, there have been some changes to the um, 
timelines and screening for hip dysplasia. Um, but the main things to remember about hip dysplasia are that it is a rare condition. Um, various studies will tell you anything between one to five in a thousand babies um, may have hip dysplasia. Um, it is predominantly a female condition, which is quite rare um, for male infants to have hip dysplasia. Um, and studies have shown um, that a family history and a baby being breech from 36 weeks um, also increases the risks of hip um, dysplasia. We typically examine the hips during the NIPE examination, and there are two maneuvers, the Ortolani and the Barlow's examination. And I think it's important for anyone who isn't NIPE trained um, or for students, um, you need to know that if, you know, I'm not, but if I was, one of the better examinations people do it. I would only pick up 60% of problems if there was hip dysplasia. Um, the one thing for me is that I examine about 500 babies a year. So I have found quite a few babies with hip dysplasia. So I actually know what it feels like. Um, and that is a main problem um, that we have in the whole world um, with the number of examinations that clinicians may undertake, um, you may go through your whole career and never actually find a baby with hip dysplasia um, because it is such a rare condition. We have the hippie doll, um, but from my experience, um, hip dysplasia doesn't feel anything like using um, a hippie doll. Um, and when you feel it, it is actually a very gentle movement, the hip because it's out of joint or will move out of joint, it actually moves very easily. Um, and when we think about risk factors, um, one that I picked up um, probably about two years ago now, um, was the woman's second baby. Um, it was a female infant. The baby had never been breached. And when asked, the mother told me that there was no family history. Both hips were dislocatable um, An ultrasound was undertaken two weeks later that confirmed um, my suspicions and the baby went into a harness um, like this. It's called a public harness, which a child would wear for about six weeks and have regular ultrasounds and checks that the harness is in place. Um, interestingly, um, when the orthopedic surgeon wrote to me to confirm the diagnosis, um, he put in the letter that of course, when the woman went home with her baby, um, and told the family, then of course the family said, oh yes, uncle such and such had that and he wore double nappies. So of course this is knowledge that's lost because this is something that somebody much older had when they were a child, um, thankfully um, were cured and no one ever knew that uncle such and such had to wear double nappies um, because they had hip dysplasia. So when we think that we are screening and we're basing our referral for risk factors on asking parents if the baby's ever been breached or if there's a family history of hip dysplasia. And we're asking this question at the beginning of the NIPE examination. Um, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, I think we really need to think about asking these questions much earlier um, in the pregnancy. So the family have got time to talk to their relatives to see if they really have got any risk factors, um, not just for hip dysplasia, but for a number of conditions. Um, I think we need to be aware of our competency. Um, and even if we are, you know, have a lot of experience and we're good at examining babies' hips, the international studies have shown that the best people, the best you can get is six out of 10 picked up. Um, so, you know, where do any of us really fit into that? Um, the provision of ultrasound, um, that's a very specialist ultrasound, um, graph grading, um, and that kind of, you know, some parents have to travel quite a way um, to get an ultrasound. Um, and then the treatment, if it's picked up early, why do we have all of this? Why are we asking about the risk factors? Why are we doing the hip examination? and wanting an early scan so that a baby can be treated with a parvic harness. Um, and the story, um, going back to that family, I actually bumped into them 
as you know, in, um, the ground floor of St. Thomas's one day um, where I work and um, I recognised the family and just tapped them on the shoulder um, and it does have a happy ending because they were coming for their last appointment um, and if that scan was okay, the baby was coming out of the harness. And then as a complete coincidence, about two weeks ago, um, I examined another baby, of course, end of the afternoon, always. These babies are always, or on a Friday afternoon, um, this situation, second baby again, this one baby was breech and it was female and there was also a family history. Um, and lo and behold, both hips were um, also dislocatable and the baby had its hip scan last week um, and went into a harness um, last week. And I'll be following that one up um, as well. So it does sound like an awful lot of intervention, maybe, you know, for every baby, because, you know, we are looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, we're trying to pick up those babies that may have this condition um, so that we can have this closed reduction with the public harness um, and the treatment um, for 95 percent of babies. They will just wear this for six weeks and that will be the only intervention. Um, if it's not picked up early, it is actually one of the main reasons um, why people have um, hip replacement surgery when they're in their kind of 30s, 40s and 50s um, for late presentation. Um, I think it's important that we don't think that we've missed it. It's, it's, it's a late presentation of the condition. Um, and it's important to remember this used to be called congenital hip dysplasia. We thought that babies were born with it but now it's called developmental hip dysplasia. Um, and very little, um, you know, is completely known about um, the condition. So um, if somebody, if a child um, shows symptoms when they're, you know, a year old, maybe there's a delay in walking or walking with a limp or um, on their toes with one foot or dragging a leg when they're trying to crawl, any of these kind of things, um, they should all be followed up um, and we would describe those as being late presentation um, of the condition. I'll just move on to the resources. So um, the latest guidance um, for midwives who are in um, England can be found in the, the first document. Um, I won't go that through that completely because it's not relevant to everybody. Um, for those of you also um, in the UK, there's an updated um, e-learning um, and that particularly has a, a great um, resource on doing the hip examination so I would definitely recommend that. Um, the STEPS charity um, I believe are fantastic they are um, now a worldwide charity and they provide resources for clinicians and parents for both hip dysplasia and talipes there are some great little videos on there of the treatments and leaflets um, for parents so that's a great resource and then just thinking about um, other conditions such as cardiac one this link here uh, from the child health um, has got a kind of an a to z of all health conditions so um, you know if you, you're caring for a, a baby um, that you've not come across something before that's a very good um, link um, positive down syndrome is another excellent organization um, and then Stanford University, um, they have 600 photographs of various conditions from every top to toe of the baby um, that can be used for education. But you can just click onto that. And if you're examining a baby and you're not quite sure, um, you can go onto that um, and you might find um, an image there that helps you with your diagnosis. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Fantastic, Mary. That's fantastic. And the, those resources are really, really useful. And I mean, I agree with you about the Stanford um, resources, because one of the frustrations, I think, when you're learning to examine babies is kind of knowing what is normal, mm. what, what is, because normal so wide, isn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah, because I often um, are asked to look at a baby that's been, you know, could be People think the baby's head, there's something wrong with the baby's head, but you say, well, actually, you can tell that baby's been 
that's normal for a breech baby. But it's, yeah. it's kind of things like that, that you can reassure people with that. But um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic resource. Um, and also for people in education, because you can use the images um, in education. It can be quite difficult um, as um, people in education um, to find images that mm. you can use that are not copyrighted. So it's a fantastic resource um, for teaching as well, anyone in any university um, around the world. Fabulous. Well, I'll remind the audience, you just need to look at the list of resources because all of the references that Mary included there are on the resource page. So if you get that, you can click on and go direct to where, where Mary suggested. I'd also mention the um, Royal College of Midwives iLearn examination mm -hmm. newborn. So there is a, quite a good, well, we're a very good graphic of um, mm. hip repl yeah. hip hip examination there as well so and that's just been updated as well yeah so that's all available i have some questions that have come through yeah. i'm going to start i shall start with Sorsha, uh because these are the questions that came through first but if you've got a question for mary you're going to have to be quick so we've got 15 minutes for this okay uh Sorsha, comment this is from claire dale hi claire she says Having just come off my first placement on delivery suite, this presentation was a breath of fresh air. That's nice. I could relate what you were saying back to what I've experienced. Well, that's fantastic feedback. Thank you, Claire. And then Kathy wants to know which, what was the book you mentioned you're reading, Saoirse? Uh, it's um, Amy Edmondson, The Fearless Organization. You, you can um, Google, um, if not, it's available on Amazon. <laughs> um, it is, it's a fantastic um, book, actually, actually, no, it's just here. Um, it is, it's a fantastic book. Um, ah, is it here? okay, got yeah. Um, and it talks about, obviously, the psychological safety in workplace learning and growth. And I think the, the fundamental part of it is actually, it doesn't just look at the NHS. I did focus a lot on the NHS, but it looks at Google and how their environment is a lot different compared to uh, a major bank in London or in New York. And it's it's really important because I think she's got the secrets from somewhere and it seems to be really, really interesting. <laughs> it's definitely a page turner. Okay, okay. And we all need those secrets. Yeah. Because we can't be narrow and just stick to nursing and midwifery literature. We need to expand out. That's fantastic. Thank you, Saoirse. Another question for you. Thank you for your presentation. What standard does your hospital follow for CTG interpretation? Is it nice, FIGO, physiological, etc.? And this is from Kate Abbott. So um, we were nice interpretation and then we moved over to FIGO, physiological. Um, so it's, it's very diverse at the moment. A lot of trusts um, are trying to make the implementation implementation of um, physiological but haven't quite made that big step so what a lot of us are doing are sort of putting physiological with our current guidance and um, we do figo and physiological um, and it's taken a big step because um, when we were trained back in the day um, we were taught obviously no there was no signs of hypoxia it wasn't really a big um, topic to discuss and now trying to implement uh, well-established midwives okay we have to talk about hypoxia so I think what, what does that mean so I think it, mm. we're slowly doing that so FIGO and physiological at the moment but with the aim in the next year or two to go completely physiological okay that's great thank you very much we've got a question for Mary now just what now this is a good question this is Claire Dale saying why does hip dysplasia mainly affect girls um, easy, we don't know. <laughs> I like Most it. of hip dysplasia, we don't know the answer to. There are lots of theories, and uh, you know, it might be hormonal, um, but it, it no, we we really, and it might be um, genetic. There is work going on, um, you know, to try and find. There is some preliminary findings in that to find the gene. So it might be. Um, mm -hmm. So it is. It is a rare condition um, in males, but. Um, I would think if you had audited all your babies, you'll probably find that about 70% of them will be female, the ones that um, okay. have hip dysplasia. Well, it's quite interesting because a baby's hip joints aren't like an adult's. And I know yes. that sounds very obvious and it probably to any anyone else listening. But when you look at the sort of skeletal development, they're really quite shallow. Yeah. Not and also like the, the preterm. Um, that's why it's Absolutely. important at 36 weeks. If you look at a preterm baby, how their 
um, you know, that they haven't got any flexion and, you know, how they, you know, how they just lie flat. Um, so, um, so just the development of the, the hips um, as well. And that's why we don't, um, we don't intervene straight away because there, there are countries where they, they scan, you know, there are some parts of Europe where they would scan all babies before they left the hospital um, because then you would over treat. So um, about half of the conditions um it's just down to immaturity so by the time they have the scan um you know the situation will have resolved and then by um if you wait another you wait till four weeks about you know 70 percent um of babies um but there will be um, always a group of babies um that will need um the public harness so it's important to tell the parents that as well because some of them when you tell them you think they've got hip dysplasia you have to explain why we're not going to do the scan mm. now um, um, and then why we wait a particular time um, to do the scan, because you want it to try and correct itself. As you say, you know, there's a lot of cartilage rather than bone in the hip. And that's why we scan rather than X-ray, not only the safety of the, um, the scan as opposed to the X-ray, um, but also it's a much clearer picture that can be found on scan as well. Great. Thank you. That's a very full answer now. <laughs> Fabulous. OK, and we've got a question from uh, Faith who says, could Dr. Sheridan please clarify, as part of night in diabetic mothers, are all babies to have a referral for further cardiac examination? Um, well, ours do. Um, I think that is a national guidance um, because we know, um, I can't remember um, how many years ago it was um, when they, they'd keep changing their names, names don't they, Kesdi and CMAs, but one of those major reports many mm. years ago was looking at diabetic mothers. And even then we knew um, that if the mother had diabetes, there was an increased risk of cardiac problems. That was, mm. um, and that the figures in that um, are exactly the same as studies that have been done in America. Mm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And we've got a question from uh, Sarah Gianni. If there has been intrapartum transmission to the newborn, how how much of the chances that the baby will show any signs of infection after 48 hours of life? Any particular infection? I think it will depend on the infection. Okay. Um, or so okay. should you have you got to want to ask, intervene there? Um, yeah, I agree. I think more often than not, um, we're, we're very high on screen and treating babies for no reason at the moment. But I think if mm mum's showing clear indication more often than not a baby that's got chorioamnitis um it would it would present in mum quite late on so if we're mm. um if we're thinking that this fetus is compromised already this fetus will show quite quite quickly sort of in the first 24 hours the first six hours of life you'll have that high heart rate respiratory distress and then more often than not a temperature will rise so yeah, quite quickly. Um, mm. but then at the same time, you don't want to jeopardise a new a newborn if mm -hmm. you've, you've had a hypoxic environment that's septic. Maybe. Yeah, because infection in a newborn could be anything from, you know, the sort of infection you might have detected intrapartum mm. through to being a carrier of group B strep. To, mm. you know, you know, there's a spectrum of infection. So, um, you know, we just have to be mindful of all the red flags where infection is um, possible for a baby. Mm. Not just the obvious ones. Yeah. I think you know, you know, if it's if something's been picked up in tripartum, I think um, you know everybody's on it. But on um, alert. yeah, yeah. And also, I think if you've got continuity of care, you know, you've got that as well. But where you've got um, systems where the care is a bit fragmented, then you know it's important to be passing on that information about the mm. possibility of any sepsis in the postnatal period. Mm. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. OK, we've got now um, a question about conjunctival hemorrhages. I'm sure this is you, Mary. Uh, subconjunctival hemorrhages. These are often not documented and cause lots of problems as we see babies at two weeks as regard to safeguarding, which you mentioned at the beginning, mm. didn't you? That's yeah. from Cathy Weston. Yeah, is there anything like that? Or um, I was talking in relation to birthmarks, but yeah, anything you find like that should be um, documented. And also, um, you know, reassuring that that's another one, you know, the mothers are very worried about, you know, they, you know, because obviously they, we don't always see the babies that eyes open much in the postnatal period, but it will be the mother that will kind of pick that up. Um, and then reassuring them that it's going to take a little while for that to 
to clear. Yeah. Mm. Okay. But yeah, a good point about um, having to document that for um, safeguarding. Mm. In a way, it's better to document too much than not enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything, anything that's um, like, you know, it doesn't take much to, you know, document something. Because most babies, they don't, you know, when you examine them, they're up, there's nothing. In most of them, there's absolutely nothing that you, it might be just a birthmark that you need to document. Mm. Uh, most, birth, most babies are normal. Um, but I think if you find something, then it is... Um, important and if there is ever a case um, we know and the, somebody has to come you know risk manager comes back to you, you you're more likely to remember it then mm. um, if you've kind of you know made sure that your documentation is um, you know as thorough as possible at the time. Mm. I think your point about gut feelings about a baby that's not quite there's something not quite right is a really good point Mary. It yeah and really. it's you know it's um it's, a de- it's just a very delicate area, isn't it? You know, mm. you've just got to, um, you know, you've just got to handle it very sensitively, and mm. um, you know, get. I always think you get the most senior person is the next person that sees mm. the baby, mm. not you know, not a whole list of people coming to have a look. No, that's good. But that's a very good point too. Thank you for that. Okay, we've got a question now, or a comment actually. Well, first of all, I think there's a. a a follow-up it's the G, a gbs infection that was the question i think that's come through right. so you, i think you dealt with that and there's also okay. early and late infection so we need to yeah. be mindful of that okay and it's always actually it's useful to check out the, the gbs website um their, mm. their charity because they have such a lot of information really fabulous to go for and there's a very thorough project going on at the moment going on in the uk so yeah. you know that hopefully we always hope that it's going to be the one that will more and more help <laughs> hopefully okay and i've got a comment from michelle sutton so useful to know about the aftercare for hip dis- dis- dysplasia and what happens after diagnosis nice getting the story actually mary i love getting this the end of the story. Midwives always love the end of the story. I'm a student learning night as part of my training in line with the new standards. Thank you to both the speakers tonight. And she sent you a little heart, both of you. So thank you, Michelle. That's lovely. And then we've got a, a question about any thoughts on pulse oximetry as part of night. And that's from Kathy also. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I was part of the pulse oximetry group. Um, there's still ongoing work. Um, I think you start with, you know, pulse oximetry is not going to pick up um, undetected heart problems. You've got to think about the risk factors. Mm. Is there a family history? Does this, is the, you know, the diabetic mothers, does the baby need a fetal cardiac scan? Um, Then when the baby's born, important that the examinations are thorough. Um, And then, um, you know, uh, you are observing a baby at any time um, and, the, the pulse oximetry study um, showed that, yes, we did pick up babies, um, but a lot of it was sepsis. And then there's a lot of intervention. Um, and it wasn't the initial um, decision was that it wasn't um, rolled out nationally at that point because there are a lot of cost pressures of, you know, you can't always get a cardiac scan in every hospital. Some babies had to be transferred 50 miles with one parent you know, the parents have to stay mm. in, there has to be a septic screen. Um, I could talk about it all day, I won't. But there is ongoing work, there's still mm. work going on um, about um, using pulse oximetry. But I think, I think always start at the beginning. Ask, is there any family history? Start antenatally. Make sure an appropriate referral um, is made for a fetal cardiac scan if there are any risk factors. And just make sure that the, you know, the examination of the baby um, is very thorough during the NIPE. And remember, it's a bit like, you know, I often say it's a bit like doing a CTG when you do a NIPE examination. It only tells you what's going on with that baby there and then. That baby could mm-hmm. collapse the next day with an undiagnosed cardiac condition. Um, mm-hmm. And certainly that period after 24 hours with the baby, um, when the ducts close um, during my career, that is when babies tend to collapse so we can do the nipe we can do it early Mm. the mother can go home but it's a bit like doing a ctg that baby Mm. is okay while you're looking at it Mm. what's it going to be like tomorrow Mm. so it's a very big um 
complex. Um, mm. You know, it's not as simple as just using the pulse oximeter when you do the NIPE, because yet mm. again, that will just tell you, yes, it will pick up more people, more babies with cardiac conditions, but it will also pick up, um, you know, pulse, uh, false positives as well. Um, and there'll be longer length of stay in hospital, more intervention. Um, and also out of the babies that were found, um, there were another two that weren't picked up. It's still not, um, you know, going to pick up every baby. One baby collapsed and was um, resuscitated. And the other baby who had um, in the study that had um, a normal pulse oximetry, unfortunately, was found to have a cardiac abnormality on postmortem. So it, nothing is going to be 100 yeah. percent. But I think we need to be very thorough from booking. Mm. Um, and I think my last point I just want to say is that there might be more children with cardiac abnormalities because we now have a couple of generations that have had surgery as children survived and had children now having grandchildren. And we certainly have more diabetics in maternity care than we've ever had. So although they're very rare conditions, you know, we will have more babies born with cardiac conditions because passing on genetic conditions and the environment that the baby's in with the mothers that are diabetic. Fabulous. Well, so thank you very much. There's Faith has said, and I'll, I'll echo this. Absolutely brilliant. Really enjoyed this evening's session. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's, I told you that the hour goes very quickly. Audience, this always goes quickly. And I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Mary and to Saoirse for joining us this evening. I think we, we, might, we might well be returning to this subject because I know it's, it's a, a huge area. And of course, Mary's focused a lot on night, but of course there's the, the other uh, features of examination newborn, which are included in here. This is your bedtime <laughs> reading. Um, and people are gonna become very familiar with the features of other bits of the examination they need to become competent with. But you've g given us lots of food for thought and lots of really good information to build on our knowledge with so thank you so much for, for both of you and obviously our audience are very happy with you so thank you very much and um, now there's I know there's going to be a little discussion going on so, so social media for a while so we might be able to to re respond to people there um, next week next week can't believe it we're going to be looking at the rhetoric and reality of being a new mum so it's we're kind of moving from the midwifery bit more to the maternity but obviously with the idea of how to support mums and babies and their new families and we've got professor amy brown joining us then in, uh, next week so i'd just like to say a final thank you to mary and Sorsha and a thank you to all of you for joining us and stay safe and stay well one of the benefits, I think, of, of a platform like this is that if you are busy clinically or if you can't watch or listen or engage um, real time, you can do this at other times. So that is fabulous for such a time as this. So delighted to be with you all, albeit virtually um, on the screen. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Dunkley bent I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. And good morning to everyone. Welcome indeed to this Scottish Midwifery Online Festival. And good morning and welcome to the Maternity and Midwifery London online festival. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Maternity and Midwifery Festival. What 2020 has shown us is that there's a real need for vigilance, that women's rights are not yet really embedded um, in our maternity system and that they can be easily eroded. My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored. The hard truth is there is a lot of racism there. It's not enough to be non-racist swimming in a pool of racism. You have to be anti-racist, actively working against racism. And I say that because when we treat the least well, 
everybody benefits. And if I had a take home message, looking at my career and where I've been in my career, my take home message would be grab it every opportunity you can. It's not a rehearsal. Know your limitations because jam too thinly spread is tasteless. Enjoy it all and let nobody, nobody steal your sparkle. And I hope that you can take valuable insights from today. And if you're listening tonight or if you're listening next week or next month, take valuable insights from the speakers from today and share the word, share the positive messages with your colleagues. Because in these dark times, in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. Thank you very much. And um, we are in this together. We stand united together.